Good afternoon, and welcome to our panel on local policy, contracting, cannabis, and nonprofits. Today, we'll hear from four diversity and entrepreneurship fellows, Nabil Aziz, Josh Kay, Leslie Vasquez, and Victor Vasquez, who worked in Sacramento this summer while conducting research related to diversity and small businesses. Specifically, each of the fellows on this panel focus their research on some aspect of local policy. Two fellows researched cannabis equity programs, one studied local contracting laws, and one fellow focused on the governance structure of local nonprofits. At the end of the four student presentations, we'll also hear from our community respondent, Elizabeth Redmond Cleveman, who's the chief strategist of sustainable growth for the city of Berkeley. Elizabeth will provide commentary to each of the student panelists at the conclusion of their presentations. My name is Noah Cole. I served as a graduate student researcher with the diversity and entrepreneurship program this summer. And I'm so excited to hear from our fellows today because I saw firsthand how much work they put into this research over the summer. First, we'll give a general introduction uh, and research background of each of our panelists. We'll first hear from Nabil Aziz. Nabil studied political science, science and is a recent graduate of the class of 2021. This summer, he interned in the office of Eleni Kunalakis, the Lieutenant Governor of California. His research is focused on the city of Oakland's cannabis social equity program. As cannabis becomes more mainstream, the marijuana market could exceed the $70 billion market for U.S. wine by 2030. However, many racial minorities are often unable to reap the benefits of this emerging yet highly exclusive industry. By analyzing the city of Oakland's cannabis social equity program and conducting interviews with applicants of the program, Nabil's research emphasized, this, emphasized the significant policy measures taken to ensure racial equity within the cannabis industry. After hearing from Nabil, we'll hear from Josh Kay. Josh is a society and the environment and rhetoric major in the class of 2023. This summer, he interned in the office of Congresswoman Doris Matsui. His research is focused on contracting diversity in San Francisco. In 1996, Proposition 209 officially banned all consideration of race or gender in public college admission, employment, and contracting. While a large amount of research and resources have been devoted to studying the impacts of university affirmative action and its outcome on underrepresented populations, little research has been done on the impact of the removal of race and gender conscious programs on these populations. Through a review of local business contract data, as well as interviews with business owners and procurement experts, Josh's research examined the current level of representation among local contractors as well as the experience of San Francisco contractors to identify best practices and areas of improvement. After Josh, we'll hear from Victor Vasquez. Victor is a sociology major in the class of 2022. This summer, he interned in the Cal Cannabis Department of Cannabis Control within the California Department of Food and Agriculture. His research topic is on cannabis social equity, the battle to compete in a competitive marketplace. Senate Bill number 1294 creates funding for state and local cannabis social equity programs. By examining local policy, speaking to and listening to stakeholders, Victor determined what makes a cannabis business qualify as a social equity candidate. Victor examined Oakland and Humboldt County. With these examples, the industry is about to begin an understanding of the big picture of being BIPOC in the California cannabis industry. And last, we'll hear from Elizabeth Redmond Cleveland, who will respond to our, our panelists as a chief strategist for sustainable, sustainable growth for the city of Berkeley. But before hearing from Elizabeth, we'll also hear from our final panelist, Leslie Vasquez, who's joining us virtually. Leslie studied political science and is a recent graduate of Cal class of 2021. This summer, she interned with the League of Women Voters of California. Her research is on how diversity of directors affect educational nonprofit governance. California is one of the most diverse states in the nation. According to the Public Policy Institute of California, no race or ethnic group constitutes a majority of California's population, and almost 30% of the population are considered immigrants. With an increasingly diverse state, there is pressure to, to diversify the workplace, particularly in the nonprofit sector. 
Many advocates of educational equity believe nonprofit organizations are stronger when directors closely reflect the people they are serving. To study the correlation between diversity and efficiency, Leslie's research focuses on the diversity of directors in educational nonprofit organizations. So as you can tell, we have a lot of ground to cover and a lot of exciting research. So I'll pass it off to Nabil Aziz, who's going to talk to us about cannabis social equity programs in Oakland. Please welcome Nabil. The history of cannabis in the United States is one steeped in class, race, and politics. Prior to 1910, the word marijuana didn't exist in the American vocabulary. Rather, cannabis was used up until that point. Now, this begets the question, how did Americans find themselves referring to cannabis as marijuana? In 1913, the first bill banning the cultivation of cannabis passed in California. In fact, the bill was heavily lobbied by the Board of Pharmacy in order to regulate opiates and psychoactive pharmaceutical drugs. The term marijuana became popular and racialized because anti-cannabis interest groups emphasized marijuana's Mexicanness. Exploiting the anti-immigrant sentiment felt at the time due to an influx of immigrants due to the Mexican Revolution. Fast forward six decades later, and we begin to witness the war on drugs and its toll on communities of color, which still lingers today. Between 2010 and 2014, nearly one quarter of people jailed for marijuana-only offenses were black, yet black people only make up 6% of the state population. It's safe to say that cannabis has been racialized and distorted in order to advance the interests of a few at the expense of the many. That being said, should the way California conducts business in the cannabis industry be used to make amends with minority communities who are affected by the war on drugs? Many city officials across the United States think so, as cannabis social equity programs increasingly gain traction. It's a question of whether cannabis should belong to the free market or if government intervention is necessary to uplift lives upended by a failed and politically motivated war on drugs. Throughout the summer, I had the opportunity to uh, conduct a research project on the city of Oakland's social equity program. Uh, the following research question, how does the city of Oakland's social equity program reduce barriers for victims of the war on drugs to enter California's cannabis industry. It helped shape the type of research and, and, and guidance that I needed in order to conduct this very research. Now, I wanna give you guys a little bit of background on the cannabis industry and why it's, one, it's a heavily regulated cannabis industry, which causes so many significant financial barriers for victims of the war on drugs, and how we can overcome these barriers to help victims of the war on drugs who seek to gain a foothold in the cannabis market. Now, because national banks refuse to lend to the cannabis sector, capital investment r remains a major barrier, hindering individuals' in ability to pay for California's significantly regulated cannabis industry, consisting of costly licenses, fees, leases, and high taxes. Also, cannabis businesses are inordinately expensive to operate because of meticulous regulation standards, such as installing special ventilation systems and following strict uh, security protocols. Um, in fact, a survey from the city of Oakland's equity program has, uh, has revealed how equity applicants ranked city approvals, slow build outs, and establishing banking services as the top three barriers to their businesses. Nonetheless, it, the city of Oakland's equity program has been designed to reconcile these circumstances by enabling the victims of the war on drugs to enter the cannabis industry with resources and opportunities. The equity permitting program reserves 50% of the cannabis business licenses for equity applicants. Additionally, because policymakers are unable to favor certain racial groups under federal law, equity applicants must be Oakland residents, earn less than 80% of the average city income, reside in a specified a high crime zone for at least 10 of the past 20 years, or have been convicted of a crime of a cannabis related crime in Oakland after November 5th, 1996. In addition, the incubation phase of the program bridges the gap between established entrepreneurs and incoming small business owners with a business partnership between equity and non-equity applicants. Oakland's equity program provides an abundance of resources and opportunities in the form of low interest and no interest loans, grants, legal and technical assistance, and a business partnership. The city of Oakland's main source of funding comes from Senate Bill 1294, legislation which provides the funding to all California cities' can, uh, cannabis equity programs. By utilizing state funding, Oakland allocates these funds, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, towards their revolving loan program, uh, which uh, equity applicants can use for licensing fees, for shared-use manufacturing spaces, workforce development programs, and legal and technical assistance. In fact, over the in the summer of 2020, 
80% of the recipients of the loan program were African Americans. Nevertheless, it's really easy to talk about the nuances of policy and data, but let's not forget its impact on real people. My research findings provide evidence of Oakland's cannabis social equity program's immense role in impacting victims of the war on drugs and its transformative capability to invest in communities of color. I had the wonderful opportunity to interview four individuals who have a deep understanding of, of equity programs. I chose these four particular individuals because I wanted to gain insight and perspective on both the participants of Oakland's equity program and those who had a hand in shaping the actual policy. First up is Jesse Grundy, a beneficiary of Oakland's equity program and now the chief executive officer of the Green Peaks. Jesse participated in Oakland's equity program in 2018. He told me he had a great experience with the program. He said the incubator phase of the program went smoothly and was very beneficial for him. When asked what are some of the most significant aspects of the program, he said that the coupling of both the priority and licensing and grants and low interest loans made all the difference for him. Next is Alfonso Tucky Blunt. Tucky was one of the first applicants of the social equity program in Oakland and was actually the first person to receive a dispensary license in the city of Oakland. I asked Tucky about the impact the equity, equity program had on his ability to start a business in the cannabis industry given so many financial and regulatory hurdles. He said, Oakland's social equity program was a reverse war on drugs in my opinion. He said, I never thought I'd be able to legally sell cannabis in my entire life. Following Mr. Blunt's interview, I interviewed Keith Stevenson, founder of the first black owned cannabis business in the United States, founder of the fourth oldest cannabis business in America, a thought leader of the cannabis social equity concept, and a member of the California Cannabis Advisory Committee under the Bureau of Cannabis Control. I began by asking Mr. Stevenson about what his experience in the cannabis industry has been like thus far. He responded with, I used to always say that I'm one of the only persons that has a chance to go to jail for going to work. Next, I asked about what impact the war on drugs had on communities of color. He replied, people don't understand how the war on drugs was utilized by the government to subjugate African Americans and exclude them from doing business. When asked about what makes Oakland's cannabis social equity program stand out from other programs, he said, Oakland has an expedited licensing process compared to other social equity programs. More so, Oakland has provided the infrastructure and the information to applicants to actually gain a footing in this industry. Lastly, I interviewed Amber Center, founder and CEO of Breeze Distro, a distribution and infused cannabis products company, co-founder, uh, co chair of board, and executive director of Supernova Women, an organization which empowers people of color to become self-sufficient cannabis uh, industry sh stakeholders. Supernova Woman worked with the city of Oakland to create its first cannabis social equity program in the entire country. Supernova Woman has also worked with state Senator Stephen Bradford's office to create SB 1294. Mm -hmm. And recently, Supernova Woman has worked with the city of Oakland to develop the country's first social mm -hmm. equity workforce development program for cannabis. I began by asking Amber about what about Senate Bill 1294's impact on equity applicants and their ability to start their small businesses. She remarked, capital investment is not enough. It costs millions of dollars to build these cannabis businesses. It's a heavily regulated industry and the social equity program gives applicants just enough to get started. Lastly, I asked her about the social equity workforce development program that she had helped establish and its significance for the community at large. Ms. Center claimed the goal was to recruit, train, and place workers within equity applicants, cannabis small businesses. She said, everyone is not cut out to be an owner, which is why this program is really important because everyone should be able to have a role in the cannabis industry, especially those who are affected by the war on drugs yet didn't want to become an owner of a business. In conclusion, not only is Oakland's equity program the first city to adopt a social equity program in the entire United States, but it's arguably one of the most well-equipped and resourceful programs in the entire country, serving as a national model for how equity programs can be structured to ensure an achievable and equitable outcome for the victims of the war on drugs. Oakland's social equity program reveals this, the government's significant role in the private sector, having the potential to initiate a catalyst for victims of the war on drugs to launch a career and become owners and stakeholders in the cannabis industry. Oakland's equity program has proven to empower those affected by the war on drugs, providing ample resources for equity applicants to jumpstart their small businesses. Grants and low and no interest loans have, been, have enabled applicants to establish cannabis small businesses, which otherwise would have been out of reach due to the bank's refusal, refusal to lend to an industry posing so many risks at the federal level. The combined impact of the state and local government's role in serving as an intermediary, providing and distributing grants and loans to historically disadvantaged and underserved communities has highlighted the importance of what the private sector can't and refuses to do 
and what the government has the potential to do. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Josh Kay, who's going to talk to us about contracting diversity in San Francisco. Please welcome Josh Kay. Thank you all for coming and uh, supporting this panel. Uh, you know, thanks again, Nabil. That was a pretty amazing uh, presentation. All of you by now at this point in the pandemic have probably heard the phrase, buy local, support local, eat local. My research specifically looks at what it means to contract local. Because, you know, over the pandemic, we've been told you should support small local businesses because that creates a competitive business ecosystem. It supports diversity in our business community. You know, all these myriad benefits. What I want to look at is what happens when the actual municipality, when the actual government chooses to do the same thing. So specifically, we're looking at San Francisco's local business enterprise program. San Francisco, which I believe had a contract budget close to $40 million over the past three fiscal years, has been able to create this local business enterprise program. And just to give a quick overview on what this program actually means, we need to go back to 1996 and Proposition 209. This particular proposition, as many of you may be aware, is widely hailed as the end of affirmative action in California. But some of the lesser known provisions of this proposition is its limitation on race and gender conscious programs, not just in admission to public universities, but in public employment and most crucial for today's presentation, for public contracting. So historically, what these programs looked like before Proposition 209 was things like lending support, financial assistance, advising to many business owners, uh, contract set-asides even, in terms of actually putting aside specific contracting opportunities to qualified minority and women-owned businesses. Since the passage of Proposition 209, generally speaking, these programs have fallen by the wayside. There are a few exceptions, but we don't particularly have the time to get into those. The crucial thing here is the attempted workaround by San Francisco, among many other municipalities, to support diversity in its business ecosystem through this local business enterprise program. Now, specifically, San Francisco defines a local business or a local business enterprise as something which is primarily based in San Francisco, has a major headquarters in San Francisco, and also has an upper bound on size. So while your local cafe may qualify as a local business, Salesforce, which is headquartered in San Francisco, unfortunately does not. I'm sure they're very upset about that. Now, I'm looking specifically at the rate of minority and woman-owned local businesses because these are the specific categories that were historically used uh, to judge diversity. These are the specific categories targeted in historic race and gender conscious programs because these are still used in the few exceptions, specifically in Caltrans, which still is allowed to conduct some diversity-based programs due to federal funding. I want to specifically caveat that minority is the exact term used, and I'll be using women and male-owned businesses specifically because these are the categories used. I found no evidence of non-binary or other gender-owned uh, businesses, but you know they do still exist out there. It's just none of I did not come across it in my research. So finally, just the b benefits of this local business enterprise program. After going through a certification process, which can be somewhat arduous to many of these business owners, they are given access to specific prime and subcontractor opportunities set aside for local businesses. They are given access to a pool of opportunities for prime contractors. Essentially, prime contractors in San Francisco have a participation requirement for these local businesses they need to meet. And they are also given specific financial aid and assistance similar to many of these race and gender conscious programs of the past. Now, in order to collect all of this data, we, I went through SF Open Book, which contains a list of various contract data for the past I don't know how many fiscal years. I only examined the past three. We looked at the web presence and uh, woman-owned business or minority-owned business status if they pursued certification through Caltrans. And then we analyzed the average and median value of these contracts and the number of contracts. 
We also conducted interviews with various members of San Francisco's business community, including several of the listed local business contractors. So I wanna start off with this particular graph right here, just to give you a quick walkthrough. From the left to the right, we have contractors whose race and gender I was unable to identify, contractors who are female and members of a minority group, contractors who are female and not a member of a minority group, contractors who are male and a member of a minority group, contractors who are male and not a member of a minority group, and finally, the sum total of all firms which we collected data on. So the primary thing to notice right there is that the average contract for contractors of unknown race and gender is incredibly high. In particular, there was a single uniform supply company who's, uh, the owner of whose race and gender I was unable to identify. This has had a somewhat skewing effect on the data, um, which I will discuss in f further. The next thing I want to note is the incredible discrepancy between the number of contracts and the value of contracts for male and female contractors. You can see here that while the number of contracts, both average and median, is roughly the same, moving between 2.6 for female minority uh, business owners and 5.2, twice as much for male non-minority members, the average contract value is significantly higher regardless of membership in a minority group. I'll discuss further the implications of this potential finding, but that's the particular piece of data I want to highlight right now. You may also notice that business owners who are female and a member of a minority group have actually higher average contract value than females who are not a member of a minority group. There's some possible explanations for this, which I will get into with a separate piece of data, but this is another important piece of information which I want to highlight right off the bat. So the next thing I want to look at right here, again, an illustration of the discrepancy between the number of firms and the number of contracts received and the value for women-owned businesses. It's a little difficult to make out the numbers uh, off this particular screen, but it, looking at the left-hand side, WBE standing for Women-Owned Business Enterprises, while about half of all participating firms in this particular fiscal year were male-owned, a little over half in all of San Francisco as of the 2012 census. Male-owned businesses received nearly three quarters of all contract value uh, accumulated over these past three fiscal years, despite receiving only about 40% of these contracts. They're receiving, on average, incredibly high value compared to their female counterparts. The next thing I want to point out is, somewhat unsurprisingly, membership in a minority status does have a somewhat dampening effect upon the average value received and the number of contracts received. This is expected, if a little tragic. We will get into a little bit more of the potential explanations, but I do want to caution against pulling too much from the data. As I'll discuss uh, further, there are some limitations to this particular study. Now, this one is, I think, perhaps the most complicated of all of them. This collates, essentially, the intersection of minority status and woman-owned status in every single business, so we have nine different categories. The big thing here to note would be that for uh, owners who are female and members of a minority group, there is a very small pool of them participating. That would be the yellow right here, which possibly led to the effect where uh, female minority business owners had higher average contract value than their non-minority counterparts. But before we get into too much of the actual implications of this, I want to talk really quick about the reflections of the business owners. The biggest thing that I want to highlight here is the upfront cost in time and resources for these business owners. They're not necessarily trained administrators. Many of them are micro-businesses. So unless they see a return in value, they are often even discouraged from even seeking to become certified as a local business enterprise and thus miss out on many of these opportunities. And for those who do take the step to be certified, oftentimes it works out extremely well for them. Many business owners express great satisfaction with the actual program itself because it allows them to network with larger businesses, build those relationships, continue working, continue growing their business. Exactly, in fact, what the local business enterprise program was designed to do. Now, I talked a lot about the limitations of the study. The big thing I want to talk about here is the inability to accurately identify data. A lot of this is, uh, op is optionally collected from the certification program, 
or based off of self-provided data from web presence. Not all businesses have a web presence. As I mentioned, one particular uniform company did not have any sort of web presence. I was unable to identify anything, and that has limited the data. The other thing is a lack of industry-specific data. Now, I mentioned, and you all noticed, the gender discrepancy in contract value. This could be a feature of the actual program, but I can't rule out any other factor specifically because the most plausible explanation to my mind right now is due to the gender discrepancy in certain industries such as engineering and construction, which typically have very few contracts, but very high value contracts. And so for these particular ones, we don't know if the huge discrepancy in contract value received for women versus male-owned businesses is due to some feature or otherwise due to an industry-specific effect. So I'd like to you know, thank everyone for coming, and that is the conclusion of my presentation. All right, great job, Josh. Next up, we have Victor Vasquez, who's going, to, who's going to be speaking on cannabis social equity, the battle to compete in a competitive marketplace. Please welcome Victor. How's it going, everybody? Yeah, this summer I had the opportunity to intern at the California Department of Food and Agriculture, their Office of Cannabis Cultivation Licensing, which was later uh, consolidated into the, into the new Department of Cannabis Control. Um, from there, I was able to take an insider's look into this project. My project kind of centers around um, SB 1294, as, uh, as Nabil mentioned. It's a grant program that helps localities establish and develop and in implement social equity programs. The author was Steve Radford, and he describes it as a bill that ensures that individuals from diverse backgrounds, underserved communities, or who have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs are able to participate in California's legalized cannabis industry. My project pretty much asked the question, is this bill working as intended? So as, as Nabil did such a great job earlier saying, if you talk about cannabis social equity, you have to start with Oakland, California. Oakland, California's program Procludes is was established before SB 1294, and was partly the the catalyst for that. Um, Oakland is a hub was a hub for medical cannabis prior to legalization, and social equity uh, tried to address the barriers to getting uh, people of color into this industry. From my standpoint, in the in the the Cal Cannabis this summer, I really was able to see firsthand how the industry is very much white male dominated. So Oakland is the crown jewel of social equity, it is the, the oldest, most robust, and arguably most successful social equity program in the country to date. The most significant barrier to entry for BIPOC people into the industry is access to capital because generational wealth is limited in this community. As we can see, and as Nabil also presented, there's a lot of options for, for social equity candidates, applicants, uh, operators to find support. I think this is due to the, the legacy of POC entrepreneurs that already were in, in Oakland prior to this, working in the medical industry. Amber E. Center is one of those people. I didn't have a chance to interview them but I did take a, take a quote from a YouTube video that I saw, and they say, you've got to advocate for these things. None of this was just handed to us. We demanded that these things happen, and Oakland said, okay. You've got to consistently continue to push them. My research finds that equity, are, uh, equity operators are not just entrepreneurs. They must be advocates for themselves, and companies like them to continue to sustain themselves in the industry. So as I continued to look at uh, SB 1294, I decided to move to look at a different uh, locality 
and their implementation of the of a social equity program. The I looked at Humboldt County, which is perhaps perhaps California's most famous cannabis jurisdiction. The the, the the cultivation of cannabis in this county was perhaps the catalyst to the billion dollar industry we see today. This is a rural county and a new program. The state funding from SB 1294 was what helped create a, a Humboldt County's social equity program. So while they were while they were establishing their program, they found that rural counties in California, including Humboldt, were uh, the places that had some of the most arrests in, for cannabis in all of the state. Um, the state award, awarded them for almost $5 million. And from a report conducted by the California Cannab Bureau of Cannabis Control, we saw that in 2020, by June 8th in 2020, they had almost 1,500 applicants. And, and distributed almost 500 licenses, but they had not given out any grant funding. I was able to uh, interview one cannabis operator in Humboldt County. His name is Timo Espinoza, and he owns Seventh Wave LLC. He owns a, he is the holder of a cannabis microbusiness license. So he qualifies for Humboldt County's social equity program under their criteria, which is different than, than, the, than Oakland. One of the things he told me was that I have not received one dime from the social equity program. All in all, zero to little help. Timo identifies as a second generation cannabis operator. His father was in the industry in San Francisco and he moved to, San, he moved to, to Humboldt County when, his, when one of his father's business uh, uh, connections gave him the opportunity to buy property up there. He told me that he was told by the Office of Workforce Development in Humboldt County, which runs the program, that he would be able to apply for fee reimbursements. But that seemed to be an empty promise, ultimately. So the Office of Workforce Development in Humboldt County runs what they call Project Trellis, which is where they, they have kind of like created a pool of money for, for cannabis equity. Where, where is this money going? SB 12 asked, the da asked for data from, SB 1294 asked for data from localities about where funding is going. Yet when asked, the Bureau of Cannabis Control stated that these reports were not available to the public. Uh, according to, to state policy, in SB 12, all state funds must be budgeted as 10% administrative, 10% direct technical assistant and 80% grants. Espinoza says, once I was finally able to apply, I was told they were only offering services. Yet this, yet this overlooks the biggest problem in it for equity operators, access to capital. I also want to mention that I was able to speak with uh, the Redwood Alternative Agriculture Fund, which is a nonprofit that did receive $50,000 in a grant from Project Trellis. So um, the Redwood Agriculture Fund, Alternative Agriculture Fund covers the cost of environmental and social sustainability certifications for cannabis cultivators in Humboldt County. So there's like, a, like talk in the industry that doing something like this would help smaller farmers as they, uh, as they try to distinguish themselves in the market but I think it over, this overlooks the, the problem that I said equity applicants don't have as much access to capital as others. To conclude, I make these recommendations for the things that the state needs to, needs to do to better help equity applicants throughout the state. The state needs to create uniform statewide standards for equity qualification to have better, better state data that can reflect social equity status and business owners outside of the few localities that run programs will also have the, a chance to apply. So when I worked at the office of cannabis uh, at Cal Cannabis, I asked 
the office for data on, you know, who's a social equity cultivator in the state, and they didn't have that data, and that's because of local control. The, the, the locality would have, that, would have that data and not the state. I also recommend the state to have a standing committee with equity industry leaders. And I also would like the state to challenge non-BIPOC non general cannabis industry leaders to help out equity business leaders. So to conclude, I have one last quote from Amber East Center. What pushes me in this industry is the fact that we can create the world we want to live in. Having the power and impact to make a difference is what makes it all worth it. Thanks, everybody. Okay, our final panelist today is Leslie Vasquez, who's going to, pre going to be presenting on how diversity of directors affect educational nonprofit governance. Leslie's joining us vir virtually, so we're gonna take a moment to make sure that she's all set up correctly. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I'm happy to be here virtually. So um, as Noah mentioned, I'm going to be talking about how diversity affects California nonprofit organizations. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so as Noah mentioned before, California is one of the most, if not the most diverse state in the nation. In the graph, uh, you could see the percentage of foreign born versus California born. Um, and keep in mind, this does not account for people who are first or second generation. The graph only shows the percentage of those current residents uh, who are born outside of the country. So uh, this graph uh, doesn't demonstrate diversity quite like it is in California. So uh, for that, I have another graph here. Um, and as you can see, uh, California is rapidly changing. The graph shows a larger influx of, you know, Latinx individuals, Asian and Pacific Islanders, and multicultural individuals starting from 1970 all the way into 2019. And so, um, as stated in my research, I studied the relationship between diversity of directors and educational nonprofit organizations across California and the overall effectiveness of the organizations. So, as you may be aware, there may be, there's so many benefits to having more diversity in nonprofit organizations. Some of them are listed here, um, which include increased productivity, um, spawns innovation, it generates new perspectives enhances reputation and promotes employee retention. So these are just a few of the reasons why um, diversity is so important to have um, in the nonprofit sector, particularly in the educational nonprofit sector. So um, for the next slide, I'll be diving into um, the nonprofits that I chose and uh, the ones I studied and kind of um, you know, what I took from these organiz organizations that I studied. So when you look up diversity, what diversity means in the workplace, you'll find tons of very broad definitions. Um, so right here, we have a very general definition, um, sort of when you Google, like what diversity means in the workplace, this is the very first thing you'll find. And it says, it means the acceptance and inclusion of employees of all backgrounds. A diverse workplace is an important asset since it acknowledges the individual strength of each employee and the potential they bring. Now, this is a very general definition, doesn't quite uh, get to what I was hinting at. So for the purposes of this research, um, I define diversity to be companies that intentionally employ people who reflect a variety of characteristics, um, including gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Now, keep in mind for this research, I do not dive into sexual orientation, um, but I do uh, dive into the rest of um, the rest of these categories. So when studying nonprofits, I conventionally measure diversity using a simple number count. Um, I took the overall percentage of people who meet various ethnic, racial, and gender categories. Um, then I simply divided the percentage um, just by the number of employees of that company. So companies are neither penalized for having more or less employees than others. Um, so Central Valley Scholars actually has um, the most employees. They have, uh, I believe, 12 to 15. Um, and Project Encourage Tomorrow has four employees and Project Invent has somewhere in the middle around seven. And so um, effectiveness for the purposes of this research is defined as how well organizations account for things like program monitoring, diversity, and policy formation. Um, now here um, in this slide, you could see some of the questions I did ask. So for program monitoring, monitoring it was like, how many people do you serve with your programs? What are your metrics? Um, for diversity, do you consider your team of directors to be diverse? Um, and so for policy formation, like have you ever had to adapt any programs? If so, and why? So, um, and keep in mind because educational nonprofits vary across subsectors. So we have high school education, K through 12 alternative education. I did rely heavily on the nonprofit organization's mission statements. 
Um, and then what I did is I compared the mission statements of each uh, organization through interviews I conducted, as well as secondary research involving existing information all available online, um, whether it be through their website or GuideStar, which is a website that contains uh, lots of nonprofit data, such as, um, you know, the, the yearly income, uh, mission statements, stuff like that. So um, and for this research, I relied on three nonprofits that I was studying, um, Project Invent, Encourage Tomorrow, and Central Valley Scholars. Um, and sort of the reason that I chose these three nonprofits is because they're all within the educational sector, um, and they all have a net income of under 500000 So I wanted to sort of make sure that um, they're more or less similar in how much money they make per year. Um, and there are key takeaways I found um, including how diversity can help foster new programs and ideas. Um, so as I said before, the first organization was Project Invent, um, whose mission is to create a generation of fearless, compassionate problem solvers. Project Invent primarily focuses on investing in high school students by helping them invent technology to solve real world, real world problems. Um, and their main method for pursuing this goal is through developing physical technology products to be conducted on what they call demo day. Um, and that is the first organization. So the second organization is Encourage Tomorrow, um, whose mission is to provide quality educational programs that empower students and families to become resilient and maintain healthy lifestyles. So Encourage Tomorrow provides a vast array of tutoring programs ranging from pre-K education to college preparation. Um, and they also provide several niche programs such as family and financial literacy for, their, uh, for both students and parents. And then um, the final organization I have here is Central Valley Scholars, whose mission is to empower students across the Central Valley to realize their potential and make educational dreams a reality. Now, Central Valley Scholars does offer a variety of programs as well. They offer workshops, mentorships, scholarships, all available to high school students. And so like Encourage Tomorrow, Central Valley Scholars provides very niche programs. Central Valley Scholars have, has what is called the Community Health Scholars Program, and it basically grants research opportunities to high school students. Um, now, before I talk about any of these, these findings that I'm not going to talk about, I do want to say that because of the small sample size, I cannot make really concrete conclusions about how diversity affects organizations. Um, more so the purpose of this research is to sort of open a dialogue regarding why nonprofits should aspire to be more diverse and what that can mean for the organization. So from my research, I did conclude that Encourage Tomorrow and Central Valley Scholars are found to be more diverse than Project Invent. Encourage Tomorrow has um, both ethnic and racial diversity in which um, you know, uh, all four members are women of color. And then 10 of 12 Central Valley Scholars directors identify as ethnic minority and or femme. And then Project Invent only had one person who identified as a minority out of the seven members. So, it is something that I took into account heavily when, you know, doing my research on this. And so um, while studying the differences and similarities between the organizations with relation to diversity, I think there are two main takeaways. More diverse organizations, from what I've noticed, uh, tend to have more niche programs specific to their communities. And number two, they tend to have a larger emphasis on stories about the students. So Encourage Tomorrow has a total of nine programs to assist students, including camps focusing on inventions, the environment, and the arts. And then Central Valley Scholars also exemplifies significant attentiveness to the communities they serve. And they offer five different programs, including you know, the Black Youth Empowerment Program, which creates a network of Black leadership across the Central Valley. And according to their website, the Black Youth Empowerment Program helps advance Black wellness, education, and creativity. So. Um, the two diverse organizations uh, not only invest heavily into their programs, but as I said before, they place a larger emphasis on student participation, um, particularly on their website. So student stories are highlighted in both of these organizations very heavily. Um, for Encourage Tomorrow, they have a section called Success Stories. Uh, so that's where they highlight a lot of students and their accomplishments. And, and Central Valley Scholars has something very similar in their news portion of their website. But Project Invent currently does not have any anything like that. So while studying these organizations, I found that although they all do incredible work, having a diverse set of directors can help foster greater innovation in the form of new projects. As I said before, Project Invent only had one project, while the rest had multiple and very niche ones. So 
I guess my conclusion is by bringing in a multitude multitude of different backgrounds, organizations have the advantage of having a range of views that ultimately foster creativity to generate new programs that help the very communities they serve. And then more so, I learned that diversity shouldn't be something that companies strive to do simply because they're changing communities demand it, but organizations should begin diversifying themselves because of the benefit it brings to the communities to have an array of talent. And as we heard from all of the previous presentations, COVID-19 has exacerbated the number of students and families needing help in California. And then also with the flourishing you know, population in California that's extremely diverse, it's time nonprofits start reflecting that type of diversity. So I don't think it's enough to just put a Band-Aid over a systemic situation. So by that, I'm going to talk about some policy recommendations I've been thinking of since my conclusion of my research. So one recommendation I think I can make um, is to implement more policies that encourage women and people of color to join organizations. So we can start during like the recruiting aspect by eliminating barriers to entry, um, such as paid maternity and paternity leave. Um, and then also like a thoughtful process of what we want to see in candidates. So I know people talk about diversity and equity, but it's um, it seems to be a lot of lip service from what I've done a lot of research on, um, but to really think of, you know, why do we want more diverse uh, employees and what does that actually mean? Why, what's the actual reason we want them to do? You know, do they want them, do we want them to reflect more of the communities they serve? Is it to make students feel more comfortable, you know, having people who look like them in positions of power? And then just more practices and policies that involve POC and women to climb up the ladder, to develop their social capital and, you know, maybe begin as an intern, but one day become the leaders of these organizations. So, um, and those are my main conclusions from that. And then I would just like to end off with um, just a quote that I got from uh, the president of Central Valley Scholars. And it says, because of our similar identities with the students we serve, we can form deep connections with our students in which they feel safe and comfortable asking for support. Our social capital allows us to build long lasting partnerships with students, counselors and organizations across the Central Valley. So I think that's the overall takeaway that I got from this is that, you know, the more diverse is actually super beneficial, not just for company reputation, but also for what it can mean and how we can build like longer substantial uh, solutions to these problems. Um, and that is the conclusion of my presentation. So thank you all so much for coming. All right, we're gonna invite our panelists back up to the front of the room. And Leslie, you could stick around on the Zoom call um, as we introduce our community respondent. Our respondent is Elizabeth Redmond Cleveland. She's the Chief Strategist for Sustainable Growth for the City of Berkeley. Utilizing her partnership development, stakeholder engagement, project management, facilitation, and research skills, Elizabeth draws on her past cross-sector experience to design city policies and programs to ensure socially and environmentally responsible economic growth. Before joining city government, Elizabeth led IHS Mar Markets Economic Strategy Solutions Regional competitive Competitiveness Consulting Practice and launched the Corporate Sustainable Customer Solutions Initiative to help clients leverage IHS's information, analytics, and insight to achieve their own sustainability objectives. In the last decade, Elizabeth has also founded her own consulting firm, Cross Sector Strategies, designed regional industry cluster development strategies as, at the Economic Competitiveness Group, and advised many business associations, academic institutions, philanthropies, and nonprofit organizations on a broad range of economic and workforce development topics. While her current focus is local, Elizabeth's work experience, Elizabeth's work experience spans the globe. She has worked on industry development and policy research projects in multiple US states, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. She also understands the importance of integrating rigorous quantitative analysis with the perspective, leadership, and initiative of local stakeholders. Elizabeth will be providing a response to the overall panel and we'll offer one question to each of our panelists uh, in response to them. So please welcome Elizabeth Redmond Cleveland. Hi everybody, thanks so much for having me. So like you said, I'm Liz. I work with the city of Berkeley's Office of Economic Development and our job is supporting local entrepreneurs, businesses, community organizations, artists, basically anybody that contributes to economic vitality in Berkeley. So we're looking at everything from increasing economic diversity in the city, increasing per capita incomes, getting people to stay with their jobs as well as getting more people into jobs, 
um, just generally improving the quality of life and ability to have a thriving Berkeley. So that means on a day-to-day -day basis, I do a lot of different things. This is right now manufacturing week. So happy manufacturing week, everybody. Yeah. It's uh, happening throughout the Bay Area. The reason I was rushing here is I was giving a tour in our West Berkeley Gilman district of some of the wines that are being produced in Berkeley. But earlier this week, I was working with uh, the owners of the Artworks Foundry where they pour copper uh, bronze to make sculptures and installations that are put in places all over the world from the San Diego Zoo to you know home collections. And then on Tuesday, we were at a brewery and we have lots of other producers in West Berkeley, but you know, manufacturing is just one sector. We obviously, some of you touched on the cannabis industry, growing industry in Berkeley, several, several new cannabis establishments here have sprung up in the last few years. Uh, I don't particularly spend time on the cannabis policy issues or on our cannabis firm outreach. So I have done a little bit of outreach to some in the context of something else I do which is support marketing in general. Someone mentioned, I think it was uh, Josh, the buy local type programs. So I oversee a number of things that are about giving back to the community, supporting local businesses. How can you spend your dollars in the community? So there's marketing, there's different industry sector strategies. We do a lot working in collaboration with the university and Berkeley Lab on making sure the intellectual property and early stage tech startups that come out can grow in Berkeley, and then we have the right type of office and lab space here in Berkeley to accommodate them so they don't all have to go to San Francisco or Silicon Valley or cheaper places to run produ production facilities. With regard to equity initiatives, there's two particular programs that I just want to mention that I've been working on in recent years um, that are not related to the ones that any of you detailed, but I'll just tell you what they are so some days other people can look at other ideas, and I'm very open to ideas that you have for how we can evolve our programs in both of these areas here in Berkeley. So one, I mentioned the sort of buy local or we run the Discovered in Berkeley marketing campaign. So it's hashtag Discovered in Berkeley on social media, on Instagram, it's at Discovered in Berkeley. In Berkeley side, there have been a number of articles that are sponsored by the city around Discovered in Berkeley. And we've been trying to feature more minority women owned businesses through those articles and to make sure that we're shedding light on an immigrant owned businesses or businesses of all different types of owner backgrounds and also business owners that give back and contribute to the community and prioritize equity and Berkeley, other Berkeley values in what they do. So if any of you have ideas for either individual companies that you think are really doing a good job here in Berkeley, like you've seen or you met with someone that you think either promote equity within their business or um, have a, a diverse owner that should be recognized for hardships they've overcome, I'd love to hear about that because those are the kinds of stories we want to tell the community. So that's one part of where we try to emphasize equity through the Discovered in Berkeley marketing campaign and, and uh, editorials that are published in the newspaper and shared widely. The other big program, which I'm also looking for fresh ideas on from hopefully IGS students, is I run the Berkeley Startup Cluster, which is the collaboration between the city and the lab and campus and then a number of our accelerator incubator programs for tech and life science biotech companies. And in light of all the tech lash that you may have heard about in the Bay Area, where you know there's both more traffic, gentrifying uh, communities, home prices going up, lack of affordable housing, we wanted to say, like, what good does tech actually bring to our community? Why do we want to foster these innovation industry jobs here? Why do we want to keep these companies in Berkeley? And so we thought, in addition to doing all the you know, policy support and marketing and, uh, you know, networking events and things to support these companies. We also wanted to encourage the companies to recognize the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and what their company and their individual founders or leadership teams could do to make sure that they're really integrating values of diversity, equity, inclusion into their company and giving back to the community. So we've done a number of programs over the last few years. Actually, we got a grant from UC Berkeley and uh, from city council to start this Berkeley Ventures, Berkeley Values program. So pre-COVID, we were having students from minority, you know, women, stu female students and students from minority backgrounds at Berkeley High School getting tours of local companies in tech and biotech so they could see how their STEM education skills could actually be applied and give them a sense of right here in their community, like do your math homework because you might actually get this cool job and hear a little bit more. And they would play these games and do real hands-on STEM activities on site at the companies. 
facilitated by Cal State Institute for STEM Education. Um, those were really well received, but then COVID happened, so we stopped doing tours of companies. So in the last year, I had to pivot to think about what more can we be doing to promote equity through our uh, Berkeley Startup Cluster partnerships. And what we ended up doing this last year and a number of other things like webinars on workforce development and some of the types of topics that you guys have covered, local contracting. But we decided to run the Berkeley Ventures, Berkeley Values Learning Lab and Pitch Competition. And so I had diversity, equity, inclusion experts from throughout the area offer to give pro bono support to individual tech or innovation industry founders to help them review, like, how are they doing their hiring? What kinds of culture are they facilitating in their company? Um, what more could they be doing to be contributing to equitable development in Berkeley? So we offered them that pro bono coaching. We held a number of workshops where we had in the end, I think, 14 Berkeley companies participate as the cohort in the learning lab. And then they all got a chance at the end to pitch. So a lot of startups are used to the idea of a pitch competition, right? They all pitch and they want to get money to fund their business. But so this was a pitch competition. Obviously, they could use the money for whatever they want. But the pitch was about what they're doing to support equity through their business. So I never seen anything like this before. It was an idea that I came up with, with in partnership with Tech Equity Collaborative, which is a regional nonprofit that does a lot of work on equity in the Bay Area with tech companies. It was really awesome. We had all these companies engage and think through like, oh, could I be doing a better job of uh, hiring diverse teams in product development so they recognize what kind of users might use my product and who I'm not thinking about when I'm developing my product? Or you know, should I be doing my recruitment strategies differently? Or should I do a volunteer day where we get out in the community, get back? All kinds of things were on the table. But we heard some great pitches. Actually, the event to celebrate them in person, now that we're able to do that again, is next Wednesday. And if any of you are interested, I'd be happy to share with Christine the invite to the Berkeley Ventures, Berkeley Values um, networking event to celebrate the companies that engage if you're interested in the topic of equity and where government can get engaged. OK, that's enough about me. I don't know how much time I have, but I did just want to say great presentations. You guys all worked really hard. I'm very impressed. I would say I'm not sure exactly what the brief was or, or like what these, I assume, were just kind of study uh, local um, program initiative of a government that's helping equity. And I, so what I took away was some awesome snapshots of and, and the value of pursuing equity. I don't know if this was something you were asked to do, but personally, I would have loved to just hear a little bit more about like metrics. Like it's hard for me to know if any of these programs are how effective they are. And, and, so, and for some of it's not your fault, but just like they're not, they haven't been going on to look at it longitudinally. Like how is it working over time? or against another similar program. Like is someone in Ohio doing this and maybe they're doing it less well or better. So I took away that these are great examples, but I don't know for sure from these presentations today if they're best practices or things that we should be trying to replicate or we just should be aware of the fact that they're happening. I also, uh, listening, I just thought I'd love to hear a little bit more about the unintended consequences or some of the trade-offs that government leaders or the program, the company, the nonprofit leaders, when you don't get equity always and everything else, like if you have a limited budget, you might be spending your time to start this new equity program or you might pave your road or, you know, and I'm not saying you don't want to have both or you don't want the people paving the road to be from diverse backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds. Of course you do. But it's like governments are always asked in my experience, do this and this and this and this. And I'm just curious, like, what the trade-offs are and in investing perhaps cash in one of these government programs or uh, you know marijuana cultivation incubators versus something else you might be doing to help incarcerated youth or whatever. Um, also was curious about like how replicable some of them were. I was I think it was um, the first one that was uh, Victor no Nabil right yeah you you talked about it. it was really interesting when you were speaking about the Oakland program I was wondering. Like, could this have, this program be as effective anywhere outside Oakland? Because maybe some of the leading cannabis entrepreneurs in the, in the world or in the you know America or California are in Oakland. So maybe this program looks really good in Oakland, but it, it seems like it might not have worked as well in mm -hmm. Humboldt. So it's interesting to see, like, are they replicable across geographies or like sizes of business? You alluded to, Josh, um, you know, it's really hard to say in certain industries or certain sizes of companies, some 
government contracting programs might actually be more effective than for other industries or sizes of companies. And then um, for the for Leslie, I was even thinking like, okay, this is a snapshot of three nonprofits in education. That's awesome that we found some, again, anecdotal evidence of diversity, but how do we know, uh, would this be scalable, replicable in other industries across other things? I could start. Um we, are, we, we all had like a, like just the summer to do our projects, so it was really hard to just try to do something longer and bigger. But l l when it comes to like uh, the social equity program uh, kind of like being transposed in different places, the problem I think ultimately was the local control because the way that it, the way that it was set up is that like SB 1294 is just a pot of money. And then the, the, the county or the, or the city could just apply to it and create their own regulations based on, based on an assessment that they did themselves on the industry. So uh, it, we just need, we would need more time to investigate each one specifically because, you know, Humboldt and Oakland are just two of the 10 programs that there are in the state. I've heard, I've heard good things about uh, 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 Long Beach, um, there is also, um, uh, San Francisco is also very, uh, very successful in their program. And I think like success is defined as like in, when it comes to cannabis social equity is, you know, how many people are in the industry? Obviously there's problems. I address some of them in my article when it comes to like the high rate of taxes for these businesses. Uh, uh, one other thing, but, uh, and that I can't think of right now, but it's, yeah, there's obviously a lot of problems and more investigation to be had, but I think uh, oh, and they're all in a specific industry because of the access to capital. It's like the you know the supply chain. They're all in like distribution. A lot of businesses are in distribution rather than like cultivation or mm. or uh, or retail because of because it takes less capital to start there. So mm. yeah, it's it, obviously we need to do more work to understand the, the problems more. Mm. Yeah, I can respond to your question about if you could replicate uh, Oakland Social Equity Program in some other state. Uh, in my preliminary research findings, I was actually planning on doing a research comparative paper on uh, Oklahoma and California and their social equity programs, but I thought it was gonna be kind of obsolete in a sense because, uh, well, it, California's cannabis industry is heavily regulated Oklahoma's is not. So that's one reason why you wouldn't necessarily need a social equity program in Oklahoma, just because there's not that many financial barriers for one to open a, a dispensary or a cultivation or something like that. Um, and, you know, you're right, maybe uh, Oakland does have a thriving African American entrepreneur community, and maybe Oklahoma doesn't. Um, and those are just kind of just two things I, I took away from that question. But um, overall, like kind of how Victor was saying, like Oakland is the crown jewel of social equity programs mm -hmm. in the entire state. And, uh, you know, the state gives so much uh, local autonomy for them to structure their equity programs, how they see fit. And, you know, I'm sure it's representative of their, you know, demographics and kind of just like how the war on drugs affected their specific communities uh, compared to others. Can I just ask what, did you uh, interview any of the people running the program? Like at, at the city of Oakland? No, that's one of the things that I was not able to do was talk to anyone from the state or from Humboldt County. I would have liked to talk to someone from the Office of Workforce Development in Humboldt County. It would have been it would have really helped my research a lot because, you know, I mean, like I said, Timo Espinoza would have qualified under the requirements, but he was not able to obtain any support. And you also? Um, I, I interviewed uh, someone who's on the Bureau of Cannabis Control, so he deals with more like the regulations of it. And then Amber Centric, she was uh, she has her own uh, cannabis businesses, but she also has nonprofits that basically helped uh, Stephen Bradford uh, uh, develop the policy of SB 94 that actually funds all of these social equity programs. So not like, directly, but indirectly for sure. Yeah, I would just say for the future, if you're evaluating, it might be helpful to hear the people who are running the program on the city level, their perspective on what's working well and what's not for before putting forward the recommendations. Anyway, that, I mean, sometimes they're hard to reach. I'm not mm -hmm. saying anything's wrong, but just something mm -hmm. to consider because I was hearing the participants feedback in your thing, but not necessarily the program leads. 
Um, I was just going to say for Josh and Leslie, if we could keep our responses like to less than a minute, just because we're a little bit short sure. on time. Yeah, of, of course. Um, I can just go real quick, just touching. You mentioned about best practices, and that's kind of what the whole idea of my project is, is, you know, because we're starting from a standpoint of diversity is good. This is an established policy, you know, goal for San Francisco, for California, across pretty much the nation. So we're now looking at we can't explicitly say we want to promote minority businesses. We can't explicitly say we want to promote women business owners. So what's the next best option? And so kind of the goal of my research, and apologies if it came off a little muddled, is looking at local businesses. If we're promoting local businesses as a whole, does that effectively do that? And the conclusion that I can draw right now is probably not, but we don't know if that's because of the actual local business enterprise program, the upfront cost entry, et cetera, or if that's just because of the severe gender and uh, racial discrepancy in a lot of these really high value contracting fields like engineering, like construction, you know, where it's not necessarily a fault of the government, but so much of it's so difficult to get a position as a journeyman if you're a woman in, you know, con construction or engineering, anything like that. So we can't really disassociate that industry effect from the certification effect. But ultimately, it comes to the point where this is kind of working, but we don't know how well it's working, you know, which is frustrating. But, you know, that's how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> yeah, so like to answer your comments last question about um, sort of this research being like anecdotal and if it would vary by industry, just because I did focus on education, I think um, based on my research, I really believe that it's uh, pretty similar across the board um, when it comes to increasing like diversity and retention of diverse uh, members within a nonprofit. Um, just because from my research of, you know, what it takes to start a nonprofit, you know, it's a lot, it's a hugely complicated and expensive process. Um, you know, people need IRS tax exemption, they need sales tax exemption, they need um, to draft bylaws, like they need uh, directors, like a board member, like a uh, committee and stuff like that. So. And then also there's a lot of policies and practices that I think discourage a lot of uh, women in POC from uh, joining nonprofits and for staying longer. For example, um, there are many nonprofits who um, rely a lot on reimbursement. So like, um, you know, team members will actually buy something for, for the team and then they'll have to get reimbursed weeks later. And that's not um, a sustainable way to keep, you know, especially people who are low income and for the first time trying to join a nonprofit. Um, and, you know, they don't, uh, they don't have the means to be covering, you know, nonprofit expenses. So stuff like that, I think, varies across the board. And I think that that just policies like that and making sure like um, equity is like being at the center of like every conversation and every uh, policy formation within nonprofits, I think is one of the most important takeaways I got. All right. Well, let's hear it one last time for our fellows and our respondents.